As the splash says, over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be talking about our story of bringing Canary deployments to our CD process and how Istio enabled us to do so. Um, so a little bit about how the agenda is going to look. I'm going to uh, give a quick talk on why do Canary deployments at all? Uh, how do we actually implement this in the real world? Lessons learned from getting it into our production systems and some next steps we're thinking about uh, in terms of extending it. So a little bit about me first. Um, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. Um, I spent most of my young life snowboarding. I was actually a competitive snowboarder uh, through high school and college. Uh, at some point there, I figured out that that was not going to be a very great career choice in terms of comfort and not So I decided to move into uh, software engineering. Um, I moved to the States six years ago to work at Yahoo for the fantasy sports site. Uh, and there we were a very small team, so being a back-end engineer, I got my hands into a lot of DevOps and infrastructure work. Um, and two years after that, I moved to a company called PlanGrid, where I started out as a back-end engineer and again moved into more of an infrastructure DevOps role. And we were recently acquired by Autodesk, and that's me at the uh, Autodesk softball tournament with my new coworkers. And uh, that brings me here. So um, today's story, like every other story you've heard at this conference, uh, is about a problem. And a very common problem that you're all probably very aware of. Uh, Release-related incidents. So at PlanGrid, while we do have a service-oriented architecture, uh, roughly you know, 30, 40 services uh, facing production usage, most of our traffic is going to a monolith. That monolith gets released once per week. There's many people in the same you know, Slack channel together getting it to work. We have to time it with schema migrations. Um, so it's still a pretty heavy process that, you know, even through all the unit tests and integration tests and load tests we do in staging, we're still crossing our fingers. So um, I can't remember exactly when I first heard about Canary deployments, but um, I got very interested in Spinnaker when we uh, bootstrapped it at PlanGrid two years ago, uh, and I've been you know, a long time lurker of the Slack channels there. And uh, around then you started hearing about this new thing called Kayenta. And I was really excited about it because it provided us with a lot of uh, scaling and uh, ability to find these issues that unit testing and all of our other testing processes couldn't find. Um, so what's Canaries? Uh, the word canary comes from um, the old tool that miners used to use before they had the technology of air quality detectors. They'd bring a small bird in the cage down in the mines, and when it started squeaking and squawking, they knew it was time to get out. So instead of a bunch of miners getting uh, you know, long-term health problems, it was just this poor little bird. Um, how does that translate into the web application world? Well, uh, when, now, when we release, instead of releasing change to all of our production-paying users, we release it to a small minor minority. And when they start squeaking and squawking, we know to roll back the release and save that from the majority. So one thing I want to uh, focus on in this talk is that, you know, even though I'm going to talk a lot about how you know, Spinnaker and Istio and Kayenta enable us to do Canary deployments, you don't need to use any of those tools really uh, to leverage the idea of exposing change to a minority and gathering data uh, to decide if that change is ready for the main stage. In fact, you're probably doing Canary deployments right now. If you have the developer flow of merging code into dev and it getting deployed to staging and you have some sort of manual QA there, that is really a form of Canary deployments. You're canarying your internal QA team or your developers and getting feedback there and then promoting the release to production. There's obviously a lot of um, uh, issues with that. You're not getting a totally accurate test because you're not testing in production. And that's kind of a new trend that I'm seeing is that we can try our best to really emulate production in our dev and staging environments, but nothing's gonna be like the real thing. So if we could somehow test in production without affecting our end users as much as possible, um, then that's great, that's something we wanna strive for. Um, so as I said, you know, it checks a lot of the boxes that other tests can't. So we have like load and integration tests in our staging environment that we try to catch all these issues with. 
Um, and if anyone has actually tried to implement load tests at their company, it works great for your first you know, uh, champions that really want to use it. But asking every single feature and service team to define endpoints, define how they're going to do authentication, uh, and manage their tests in a whole other platform doesn't scale. We've had very bad experience with that. Uh, integrations are the same way. There's a lot of assumed state. You need some project or some user that you know exists in this environment. Uh, and it's just really hard to um, sort of bootstrap that in every feature and service. Um, so what I really love about Canaries is that how well it scales. You're not defining any tests. You don't have to have any state dependencies. You're relying completely on your real traffic to do your testing. So what does it actually look like? So um, most web apps at a high level look like this. We have traffic coming from somewhere, you know, the internet, um, internally, uh, something. That goes through a router, whether it's a, uh, you know, reverse proxy, load balancer, whatever. It's taking traffic and moving that to your production servers. Uh, your production servers are running some code, and it is reporting metrics to some centralized uh, metrics tool, hopefully. Um, so what Canaries do and how it changes things is it introduces two new deployments. The idea of a baseline and a canary. So the baseline you can see is running v1, same exact code as production is running, and canary is running v2, or your release candidate. Uh, and you'll also notice that production is running many servers, whatever your uh, default you know, replica set count is at, and then baseline and canary are gonna be running substantially less. And I'll go into a little bit why, uh, why we do it that way. It has to do with trying to emulate load as much as we can without having equal traffic going to those deployments. The last magical piece is that once you have all your metrics being pumped into Datadog, New Relic, whatever you use, you have to have some thing that's going to ingest those metrics and be able to compare uh, between those two sets and make a decision on, uh, is this change good? So some goals of actually getting canaries into our production pipelines. So we want to expose a small set of users to the new code, right? We don't want to have to expose you know, 50% uh, or more traffic to this experiment. We'd like to use, uh, expose the minimal set required. We want to be able to c compare these KPIs between versions. So you know, latency and whatever it be, we don't uh, want to dictate exactly what those KPIs are, but we want to be able to compare them in some way. Same code, same app, two different deployments, and somehow be able to compare them. We also want to be able to automatically roll back regressions or canary test failures. Uh, and that is very important because of the way our dev workflow is now, is that we're really kind of a, a GitOps shop where you merge to a branch and it gets automatically deployed. Application developers rarely have to open Spinnaker or look into what's actually happening. They merge. It gets deployed, and when we introduce canaries, we don't want to have to break that workflow uh, by injecting some uh, human decision step. Things we're trying to optimize for when we're generating this experiment. Uh, the first one is limiting noise. And if you look at a lot of these canary best practices, you're going to see that it's really recommending deploying this baseline deployment. Uh, and you're going to maybe wonder, why would I redeploy code that's already out there? <clears throat> the idea is that you want to minimize any deltas between those two things, the canary and your existing code. So you don't want to take advantage of long-running process things like caching uh, and long-lived connections. You want to launch them at the same time and uh, compare the two uh, code deployments. There's also cases where uh, you might make configuration changes that haven't been deployed to your uh, existing production deployment. So in that case, uh, when you launch your baseline, you're going to notice that change. And really, the things you're comparing uh, for us, at least when we deploy containers, is the actual change in code. So, canary deployments. What are the challenges? Uh, I'm going to go into one way that we solved for this and actually implemented this. But if you want to bring this to your organization, the one thing you have to focus on is solving for these three challenges. The first one is routing. You have to find a way to route traffic between your default production deployments, and your baseline and canary, that's completely transparent to your users and clients. The second challenge is actually analyzing the difference. So you need something to look at the metrics being produced from your canary and your baseline, and you need to have it be able to decide, is this good or not? 
And the final step with uh, Judge Judy is what do you do with that information? What happens with a pass and a fail? Uh, how does it impact your deployment? Um, in our case, we want to have it automatically roll back and also automatically promote that release candidate to production. So, how do we do it? Uh, I'm going to step back here and give some context a little bit into how we deploy at PlanGrid and what our uh, Spinnaker infrastructure looks like. So we have a monorepo that has all of the application deployment configs and the pipeline templates in it. Um, what that looks like, if you look on the right there, is we expose this interface to developers that's a very compact uh, YAML file that you define a branch, in this case master. It's gonna get, it's gonna push to this pipeline every time a new commits there. Uh, we named the pipeline prod and it has like Slack channels to notify users. Uh, you can add your own DNS names and then target size and there's uh, several other things we expose there. And then we have uh, a single Jinja template that this YAML, these YAML values get pushed into and we take that template and put it into Spinnaker. So uh, yeah, deployment runtime, all defined in that YAML interface. And we have a one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one -to -one mapping of GitHub repos, deployable web services, and a default domain name. So uh, when you're in Spinnaker, you'll have, if I create a GitHub repo that's my app, I'll see, and I create a my app YAML file in this Spinnaker configuration monorepo, I'll see a my app application with whatever pipelines I config in Spinnaker. Uh, and we give everyone a standard C name, uh, basically your repo name, your env, and then our plan front uh, postfix. Uh, going into a little more about how we'd actually like uh, manage these deployments or define these pipelines and distribute them, uh, that's me as Beavis, you know, creating these new pipeline templates and creating changes to how we deploy. I merge that to uh, our branch on GitHub. Jenkins picks that up and essentially just runs Jinja to build your actual pipeline JSON and then straight up copies it into S3, and that's where Spinnaker reads from uh, to get its pipeline definitions. This is what our infrastructure looked like when I first tried to get Canary deployments in. Uh, this was a long time ago. Uh, basically, we have uh, the array of clients that we have, we distribute to our users, and our Kubernetes services. And each Kubernetes service was actually a load balancer service that had its own ELB, its own DNS name. Um, so, I mean, right off the bat, you can kind of see some problems here is that um, if you want to connect to a new service, that's a new domain. So service discovery was a big problem. And as you'll see soon, that made routing between deployments a big problem. So first try, Hack Week. Um, at PlanGrid, we have Hack Weeks twice per year. Uh, and this is a great time to you know, step off your roadmap and try something new and fun like canary deployments. And this is something I've been thinking about for a long time and I've had negative free time to do. So I put on my beanie and got my friends in a room and we started trying it out. So how'd it go? Not well. Um, routing is really hard if you don't have some sort of centralized API gateway or something that can intelligently route traffic. Um, looking back, there are some ways you can accomplish this using a basically a, a coarse grain routing or assume that um, you have a certain set of pods serving, serving traffic, uh, containers, uh, EC2 instances, whatever, and you deploy a certain amount with the new code, and you can assume that some percentage of traffic goes there. However, it's very hard to communicate that to developers and say exactly how much traffic is going to go to your Canary and baseline, so we chose not to go that route. Also at the time, we didn't have very standard metrics. It wasn't easy to compare metrics between deployments. Uh, Kayanta was also really young and the documentation very fresh. So a lot of it was going into source code and actually figuring out how things worked. And it just wasn't realistically accomplished within a week. Okay, hack week, six months later. Let's try it again. Um, but this time, uh, have some help. Uh, in that uh, time difference between those two hacks weeks, we released uh, an infrastructure change to our Kubernetes cluster to have all traffic go through a single Istio gateway. And you can see on the right here, we have a single ELB now that instead of having a uh, distinct C name, we use wildcarding so that we still distribute uh, you know, your service name dot some postfix, but it all goes to the same ELB and we defer to Istio to actually route that to your Kubernetes service. Why that was so powerful and helped us a lot was because that Istio gateway 
act as a traffic management system that made it very easy to split traffic completely transparently uh, to the clients between different services and deployments. Success, it worked. So we actually got this working in Hack Week, or at least to a POC level, um, which gave me uh, some good ammunition to go to the rest of the org and say, hey, if we invest a little more in this, we can get a huge amount of value. So let's go back to the challenges and see how uh, we solve for them. Um, so again, routing, analysis, and judgment. So routing, how does it work? So what we do is we deploy the release candidate to an entirely new Kubernetes service uh, with service name dash canary. We find the existing Docker container running in our default production deployment and deploy it as service name baseline. This helps us a lot to differentiate metrics in uh, Datadog, which is our metrics provider, um, and make it just really easy to do that analysis stage, which I'll get into. And for the actual routing between these two deployments, we use uh, Istio's traffic management feature to split traffic based on weights uh, between those deployments. And what Istio gave us is actually fine-grained control to split traffic down to the single percentile point. So diving deep into actually what this looks like in Istio, uh, for those not familiar, virtual services are Kubernetes CRDs or custom resource definitions that you apply in a manifest stage or just a cube cuddle apply. And that defines routing for a specific host. So in this case, api.planger.com, if it gets a request with that host header, it's gonna apply the following HTTP routing, which in a steady state is routing 100% of traffic to the API default deployment. Now, during a Canary experiment, how do we change that? We basically just have to change the destination routing rules. So for us, what we're doing is now we're deploying uh, or routing 90% of traffic with that, that's um, defined by that weight 90, to the API default deployment, and then 5% to the baseline, and 5% to the Canary. Analysis, how does that work? Um, so we tag metrics based on the service name, send that to Datadog. We configure Spinnaker to consume those metrics. We create default Canary configurations for every single app that consumes those metrics, and then create a Canary analysis stage with Kayenta as the consumer once routing is configured. This is a little hard to read, I realize, but uh, this is sort of the things in uh, Istio you have to provide to get this to work. First thing you need to do is create a handler, and that basically tells uh, the Istio mixer, which is in charge of all of the uh, telemetry routing, uh, so request tracing and all of your default HTTP metrics. Uh, we just configure it to send everything to the Datadog agent, um, you know, append some prefix to make it easily uh, searchable in Datadog, uh, and then create our own custom metrics. In this case, I'm demoing request count. Um, so you reference it here, and then you define it up there, and you can get all of the Istio metrics that Mixer provides and encapsulate that into a way that is easily consumable in Datadog. Uh, and this is what that ends up looking like. So um, one of the great things about that SEO gave us was this kind of master Datadog dashboard that gives us all of our HTTP metrics and we can toggle between apps, the very top, that destination app tag. Uh, we can go through any app and see, um, you know, server errors, request counts, latency, et cetera, uh, and actually compare that between uh, destination apps. You'll also see there's a source app option up there, so we can actually find latency from a source, not from, say, the gateway, but from my app to your app, and vice versa. Uh, what you also need to do is configure uh, Spinnaker via Halyard um, to ingest these metrics. And that's pretty straightforward. We actually apply the Halyard config in salt. So we don't actually do the Halyard configure and then deploy stage. Uh, we, we plug in the configuration uh, raw. And it looks pretty straightforward. Point it to Datadog, add your super secret secrets, and you're good to go. Um, so how Canary configs work? Uh, this is something we're still trying to figure out. How do we enable feature teams to get on board with canaries uh, with the least amount of friction? And right now, the path forward is give them a very straightforward, simple canary config. 
And what the config does is it tells Kayenta what metrics am I ingesting and how should I decide if something is good or bad. Uh, so I'm going to go through this and uh, give a high level view of what this would look like in the Spinnaker UI if you actually wanted to create your own Canary config. First thing is you configure a name and then a metric store. You can have multiple metric stores defined in Spinnaker to ingest stats. At the time when we built this, there was only Datadog, uh, but they've added new relics since, uh, and that's something we're actively building towards integrating right now. You then define your metrics. Those metrics can be put into groups. The significance of groups is gonna be apparent in a few slides. Uh, but for us, all we use out of the box is latency, 95p and average latency. Those are defined here. You give your metric name, scope. Uh, you can also have a little more fine-grained control of how powerful you want those metrics to be or how uh, opinionated you want your canary analysis to be in terms of this metric. So uh, you can imagine uh, server errors, 5xx errors. You might want to put a little more weight to them uh, and fail instantly if that metric fails. You also want to define if uh, which way is bad, right? So are you doing, are you comparing uptime? Then you would want to create, uh, uh, or at least configure it to pick up on decreases. But for latency, we obviously want to know if it increases, uh, that's a warning sign. So now what you can do with your groups is give weights to them, which sort of tells Kayanta how important is this group of metrics. So because we only have latency, we're giving everything to that. But you can imagine in the future, if you extend this to use business KPIs, server errors, uh, CPU and memory usage, you might have different biases towards each one uh, historically based on incidents uh, in your organization. So the last challenge, judgment. How does it work? So we want a way to instantly take the information Kayanta gives us based on uh, how those metrics were uh, differentiated between the two deployments and act on them. Either continue the deployment and take that release candidate and put it into our default production deployment facing all of our users, or do we want to stop immediately, roll back, and put 100% of traffic back to our uh, default deployment? So how we did it is actually instead of destroying um, the Canary and baseline and then you know, redeploying or anything, we're doing it completely with Istio routing rules. So right here is sort of our cleanup stage or our steady state stage for every app. This gets executed, as you can see, uh, if the deployment pipeline is successful, it failed, whatever. As soon as it's over, we always wanna go to steady state. If the Canary failed, we're not gonna deploy the new code to the default production deployment, meaning that this will actually be routing traffic 100% back to your old code. If the canary was successful, then that pipeline, cockwet prod brisket, is going to actually complete the release, take your release candidate and deploy it to the default deployment service name, and this cleanup pipeline will then route 100% of traffic to it. With exception handling kind of being a bit shaky in Spinnaker, this is really the best way that was available to us. So what we got out of it, did all this work, got canaries in, pat ourselves on the back. What happened? First, the good. I love this slide. This was uh, almost immediately after we went out in production. Um, an engineer added a new query to our monolith that ended up in a sequence scan against our Postgres database. It passed unit tests, it passed integration tests, it passed manual QA, it passed canaries in our dev and test cluster because it wasn't getting enough traffic. Only when it went to production did we see this huge spike, right? And the canary instantly failed. When we went and looked into New Relic at our APM metrics, we could find the exact transaction that was causing it uh, with a bunch of timeouts, and that saved us from a production incident, saving the majority of our users from downtime. Yay. The bad. So I'm gonna go over one big incident that actually occurred um, from releasing canaries into our CD pipelines. And this was a race condition that was kind of triggered by the force cache refresh issue in CloudDriver. So I showed you those two pipelines. We have our default deployment pipeline and then that cleanup pipeline. What happened was we ended up deleting or destroying the baseline and canary deployments without resetting that routing to go 100% to our default deployment. So we were still routing 5% of traffic to things that didn't exist, 
And Istio hates that. And it shit the bed, and we had a production level outage. So this is what our default deployment pipeline looks like. Uh, it's kind of complicated. I won't get into most of it. But you can see that we deploy the baseline and canary. We apply the Cacoet manifest, which is really that traffic management manifest that sets 90% of traffic to the default, 5 and 5 to the canaries and baselines, and then does canary analysis. If that last stage fails, it'll stop the deploy and not deploy new code. If it's successful, it will deploy new code. But no matter what, when this is completed, it's going to run the cleanup pipeline, which originally looked like this. So apply Cocoa and Manifest, again, sets us to a steady state of applying 100% of traffic to that Canary and Baseline. And then we wanted to clean up after ourselves by destroying the Canary and Baseline deployment. The problem was, is we were in the midst of destroying these gr server groups, and CloudDriver was just spinning, and spinning, and spinning, and spinning. Meanwhile, because there's no mutex lock or any idea of locking down pipelines based on another running, the default deployment pipeline started running again. And as we're destroying these server groups, it set that routing rule to route 5% of traffic to those two things that no longer existed. So that was a pretty hairy problem. Uh, and going back to the pipeline, uh, you can see like uh, we apply the Cockwit manifest and then run canary analysis for a long time. As it's hanging there, that uh, we noticed that CloudDriver was in the midst of destroying something and only destroyed it midway through the canary test, and bad things happened. So we just changed it to instead of cleaning things up, just focus on routing, have 100% of traffic go to the default, and just keep those canary and base signs up. So in the worst case, we aren't routing traffic to something that doesn't exist. The ugly. So apart from actually operationalizing this and getting this to work, uh, there's a human problem here, right? This is a big change to how your apps get deployed. Um, that's me getting blamed for a bunch of things, and my coworkers being justifiably pissed off about it. Um, these all stem from something called false negatives. So you have your canary going, and you configure it with latency and server errors, and it fails. Why? You go in, you look at logs, APM, and nothing looks wrong. Then you go into your Canary report and you notice that one request happened to timeout. And Kayanta took that as, this is bad, right? We were doing things in 10 minute windows. It saw that as a breaking change and killed the pipeline, which meant engineers would have to stay for the entire Canary analysis stage, which for us was an hour. And maybe only 45 minutes in at that fourth interval would it fail. Um, and then you have to go back, look and see if anything was wrong. And it wasn't and confidence started to break down into how, what kind of value canaries can bring. So what we learned. You have to treat pipeline changes as a production change. So owning these managed deployments and the sort of master Jinja template that generates all these pipelines, there's a lot of responsibility there, right? Any change is going to affect every single uh, pipeline that you deploy. Uh, so what we ended up doing was forking that global template and then opting in apps one by one, getting champions to onboard and then bringing it to the rest of the org. First time we released it, uh, and we did have um, an actual um, bad release change caught by Canaries, there was a big question of what now? Because the Canary and Baseline are still putting metrics to the same tools, and there wasn't a great way to differentiate between them. We had the difference in Datadog, but before Canaries, if you release a poorly performing deployment, the first thing our engineers go to is the APM to see exactly which endpoint was broken. So then they can go into GitHub and see exactly which commit broke it. So then they can get blame and yell at someone on Slack, right? That's the process that you want to start streamlining. So what we did is we made sure that every time we deploy a Canary in baseline, they get new apps in all of our tools, bug snag, log entries, um, new relic. So it's very easy for engineers to go in and debug the same way they would any other performance breaking change. Uh, the separate cleanup stage, we actually originally tried to follow the best practices guide and have the canary analysis and deployment and cleanup all in one pipeline. But Spinnaker just doesn't give us that um, you know, exception handling we need. And so it was very difficult to do using the sort of catch-all that Spinnaker does provide, where you can kick off a pipeline based on another ending. Uh, we've had a lot of success with that. 
data. We also tried to release canary configurations with a lot of metrics. Latency, CPU, memory, 5XX, everything. And when you first release that and you're trying to tune things, it's very difficult to do when you have 10 knobs in front of you. So we cut that down to just latency and we've had a lot more success onboarding apps that way. Intervals, so going back to some of the goals and things we were optimizing for, we want to fail fast and deploy fast, but still get enough sample size to have confidence in our signal. Originally, we had five 10 minute stages, which meant your canary analysis would run for 10 minutes, evaluate, and decide whether to continue or not. And it would do that five times. And we noticed that a small amount of noise in that fourth and fifth stage could break everything. Right? So engineers were going to be waiting for 40 minutes, and if it fails, you got to kick it off again. So what we tried instead uh, to balance that is to have one stage that runs for 10 minutes that looks at very heinous changes. So server errors only um, and like crashing, just like the really bad stuff for 10 minutes. Then 50 minutes for more performance issues, uh, you know, latency, mem usage, CPU, etc. So it used to look like this. We apply the routing rule, do a canary analysis stage that's configured to run five 10 minute stages, uh, and then deploy. We changed that to have two different canary configurations, one for the initial that's very aggressive over 10 minutes, and then the secondary one that runs longer, gets more sample size, and can get better signal on those latency metrics. Break glass deployments. So something that we saw was Deployments were now taking over an hour, right? Because we wanted to get a large sample size. And some developers really wanted to get something out. For instance, if it's three in the morning and they get paged and they absolutely need to release a hotfix, how do they get around that hour deployment? What we did was add a, a parameter into our Spinnaker pipeline that would allow you to skip all the canary stages. So if you set that to true, you wouldn't have that extra step of applying that routing, deploying, the, deploying those two new deployments, having the hour long analysis stage, which took us down from you know, an hour 15 minutes to sub 10 minute deployments. Some next steps, things we're thinking about in the future. Testing our canaries. So now we have a lot of data on containers that have successfully passed and shouldn't have, and containers that didn't pass and shouldn't have. We want to be able to tweak our canary config without waiting for an actual production change to come in to assert that it works, right? We want to test with previous uh, deployments, much like your regression test that you would write um, for your app code. We want to do the same thing for our canary configs. Adding business KPIs. So in a microservice architecture, looking at your own latency and uh, impact on clients directly connecting to you sometimes isn't enough. Sometimes there's a small change that you make that isn't discoverable with uh, HTTP metrics, and you want to look at more, more of a high level, especially for a monolith. So when we make changes, we want to see making sure that people can still log in at an appropriate time, upload sheets, view projects, uh, invite users, et cetera. Uh, chaos analysis. So we've been talking today about mostly canarying code changes, but with Kayanta, you can compare anything, right? Two deployments of anything. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is actually have two deployments running the same code, but using Istio, we can actually cut out Redis connections for one deployment, or make Postgres queries take twice as long, uh, or kill connections to one of our third-party APIs. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, for, for assumptions we make, like we can survive a Redis outage, is that actually the case? And we can actually automate this now with Kayenta and Istio. More intelligent routing. So the way I've shown is that we route traffic purely based on percentile. It doesn't look at um, you know, headers or where the request is going. It just uh, does like sort of round robin with percentile points. What we want to do in the future is actually be able to uh, use more of Istio's traffic management to be a little smarter about who we expose to the canary. So maybe we don't want to, don't want to expose 5% of all our users. Maybe we want to only expose the people using our free trial, right? Or maybe we... <laughs> <laughs> 
Maybe we'll want to only expose plan grid users or like internal developers in QA, right? There's a lot of options there um, that you know, Istio gives us that capability. We can also canary totally other things, DB migrations, uh, config changes, any changes in state in our infrastructure, we want to be able to leverage uh, Kayanta to help us out. So thank you very much for taking time out of your Sunday. Uh, if you'd like to talk more, I'm OA Hater on LinkedIn, GitHub, and the Spinnaker Slack space. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think we have time for questions. Go. Hi, I'm just curious about uh, how, how does like uh, your load increase automatically based on canary being successful? Sorry, can you repeat that? How does like uh, let's, let's just say if your canary is successful and you want to run like 100% of the traffic, do you incrementally increase it or do you have any automation or how is it set up? So in our default deployment pipelines, what happens next after that canary analysis stage, if it was successful, is it goes to the deploy stage, which is uh, we use the V1 Kubernetes provider that just does a blue-green deploy. And after that, you're in that state, you have 90% of traffic going to the default deployment, which is running your new code, 5% running to the baseline, which is running your old code, 5% to the canary, which is running your new code. That cleanup pipeline I showed listens to whenever that default deployment pipeline ends, which would be right after that deployment, and then sets 100% of traffic to the default deployment. So that would be running your new code, exposing 100% of traffic uh, to the new deployment. Do you have any use cases where you needed to slowly, incrementally increment the traffic like over a period of 24 hours from, mm -hmm. I guess, one person to 100 person? <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. We, we don't do that, uh, but that's definitely something we could explore. This may be more of a question for, for the room, but maybe also for you. Uh, have you figured out like automated ways of canary and things where there are like queues involved as opposed to just HTTP routing? So who wants to, uh, I think people maybe know mm -hmm. if your code is consuming from a queue and wants to see how it's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really what's, what's uh, what Spinnaker does to make that really useful for code deployments is that we know exactly when new code is being deployed to a Canary baseline, so we can tell it now is the time to run a Canary analysis stage. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. You can kick off Spinnaker pipelines you know, from anywhere. So you could have your own thing, whatever it is, um, doing something, and then it can make a call to Spinnaker saying, hey, I need to run uh, this Canary or Kyanta stage where I want to compare metrics from two different things do that, ingest it, and then make a decision. Um, Spinnaker just makes it really easy to tie it and visualize it with the flow of your deployment. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about Istio. Because, so you are creating your routing rules uh, in your pipeline, right, with Spinnaker. But how do you make sure that it doesn't get misused by some people? Because it's pretty scary so if you start uh, messing with the routing in production, that's something that might be starting walls very quickly, right? Yes, very scary. And uh, we haven't really figured it out. Um, basically, the way we have it running is the only places that define routing rules are in those two deployment pipelines I showed you. Um, and we, ver we limit access to our Kubernetes controllers to a very small set of engineers, so no one can just go in and like kubectl apply some, some broken shit. However, it's very possible that someone comes into Spinnaker and goes into one of these pipeline configurations and fat fingers something and deploys it by hand and breaks shit. Uh, it's, yeah, it's very difficult to uh, restrict that. Do you have any paths you want to explore to so something we want to do is rip out that uh, routing from the deployment pipeline and have only one single pipeline define routing and it be configurable. And then we want to use something like Fiat to uh, restrict access to that. Whether it lives in a different application or, or whatever, um, yeah, we'd like to have that more centralized and a little more security around it. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Yeah, I was just curious how you decided on the canary runtimes, how much experimentation you did that. Right, so uh, first thing we went off was uh, Google has a great best practices one that they've had experience with at, at Waze, and we went off that. Um, and it suggested um, instead of time, it looks at number of data points that you need to make a decision. So we started off with an hour, uh, and we're still rolling with that, but we are still seeing some issues where we don't get enough sample size for non-monolithic apps. So it's a lot of tweaking. You know, a lot of this is sort of continuous improvements. Um, the good thing about Canary configs and, and deployments in general is that instead of pushing all the work to manage testing onto the feature teams, who will inevitably drop it, at least it's in a centralized place where we can make an impact for all services, right? So if we find out that uh, extending it to two hours and you know, one hour windows greatly improves signal for some of our apps, we can roll that out to any, everyone very easily. Uh, but still a lot of experimentation. We haven't figured it out totally yet. Um, before deciding on using Istio as the uh, service mesh, did you consider something like um, console and connect? We did. Um, we had sort of an Istio champion at our company who um, was very comfortable with it. We actually started using it in our staging environment at 0 .08, uh, 0 .8, uh version. So um, early adopters, we got pretty comfortable with it. Um, we actually used it mostly as an API gateway at, at the start. We didn't deploy sidecars until very recently. So it was totally used for as basically an, an ingress controller. We, we act, yeah, we actually do it at the service level. So inside that like master pipeline JSON, we give everyone a sidecar who, uh, at first it was opt-in, right? Because we want to do some incremental changes and not just blast our entire infrastructure and production with sidecars. Uh, we wanted to see how it impacted individual apps. Yeah. And actually we've found a lot of issues there where um, our apps have had trouble connecting to Redis over SSL through sidecars, which seems to be a known issue. So we still have a lot of like opt-outs for certain IPs um, in sidecars. So I would recommend if anyone's trying to implement Istio in their clouds, uh, don't go straight to the automatic sidecar inje injection. Do it app by app um, in, a, in any way that you would you know, normally roll out infrastructure changes.